Today's guest, the legendary Hall of Fame baseball player, Johnny Bench. 14-time All-Star, 10 gold gloves, winner of six division titles, four pennants, two World Series. But what Johnny Bench has done for our men and women in uniform speaks volumes about who he is and how he continues to give back in a major league way. What a way to start season three. From Ballard Studios in Washington, D.C., a special edition of 13th and Park. You and I can differ, but that doesn't mean you and I cannot be friends. That often is missing in politics. We went from North Korea to Eminem. That's a lot, man. Aliens could have invaded and nothing would surprise me at this point. It's a nightmare. Those are the facts. We have to solve everything. What's in this team? <laughs> Johnny, great to have you on the show today. I have a little bit of hero worship here, so forgive me <laughs> if these questions all feel like softballs instead of hardballs. Let's start with something more current. It was a sad event, the passing of Willie Mays. I know you had a special relationship with him. He was an icon, not just for the game of baseball, but for the nation and was known around the world for his qualities. You said he was everything. He was what baseball is all about. Tell me about that. I'm a hero worshiper, too. I mean, I grew up with Mickey Mantle was my idol, and it was Mickey, Willie, and the Duke. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all you do. And, you know, Willie Mays was everything to baseball. He was the flair. He was the drama. Everybody wanted to be Willie Mays, catching that ball in the basket catch. You can't do that. I mean, it was impossible the way he did it. People to this day don't understand how hard that was because the ball can move four or five inches just from the head to your waist. And, you know, my dad had served two inches in the war. He, he wanted to be a major league baseball player. The war came along. He dropped out in the middle of high school at his senior year, joined the Army, served in North Africa and Italy for eight years. So his dream never was fulfilled. He played Sandlot, amateur baseball. When he came back, he played to pick up teams and independent teams. In fact, I, I was there with a the game when he faced Satchel Page. Satchel used to tour as well. And we're watching the game, and the announcer comes on and said, now batting the next superstar the switch heading center fielder from oklahoma and i'm three and a half years old i looked at my dad and i said you can be from oklahoma and play in the major leagues right i grew up in a town of 660 people and we had to knock on doors to find another player hey right. can adam come out and play today no he's doing a podcast and we play and we'd, we'd lose and my dad said well, that's all right we'll get him tomorrow let's go get a cheeseburger and at the end of the year we played a team that was undefeated and we beat them and they were over there crying. And today it's the parents that are over there crying. Right. So I looked at my dad. I said, what's wrong with him? He said, they haven't learned to lose yet, son. Let's go get a cheeseburger. So my dream was, you know, obviously to be a major league baseball player in the second grade. I said, I wanted to be it. In the eighth grade, I wanted to be it. They laughed. Everybody laughed. Because in the eighth grade, I was five foot two. I had the same size hands, same size feet, size 12, same size head. So the only people scouting me at that time was Barnum and Bailey. I mean, there, and there was no interest anywhere. By the time I reached my junior year, I'd grown eight or nine inches. And, and I was playing on an American Legion team where the scouts were around, so they saw me play. So anyway, I signed my contract when I was 17, flew on my first plane to Tampa, Florida, got off the plane. They took me to the ballpark. They dressed me in a uniform. I caught in the bullpen in the seventh inning, warmed up the pitcher in the eighth, and caught the ninth inning of that ball game. And they, they released the other catcher that night. And now I'm, I'm a professional. So now, two years later, I'm in the major leagues. In 1968, I get voted to the All-Star game. And as a, an alternate, one of the three catchers that was on the team, I'm sitting there in the clubhouse in the Astrodome. Directly across in the locker across me was Willie Mays. I'm 20 years old. He walks across there and he looked at me and said, you should have been the starting catcher and went back to his locker. I didn't have to play. I didn't have to do anything. I was already designated as an all-star, and, and right. my life was complete. And Willie talked that way, boys. He said, man, I'm on second base. He said, they got this young hot shot catcher the for the red. Right. And I'm on, if I get a single, I'm going to knock his ass in the <laughs> dugout. We got a base hit. I slid around. I came around third. I slid in the home. said, you ever hit a tree? I went, mm -mm. <laughs> to this day, I looked up and he said some very choice words about getting off of him. Just not quite that simple. 
Yeah, but you talked about an experience where he came to the plate and you described it appropriately. He had the swagger, right? When Willie Mays came to the plate, he had that swagger. And there was one moment where he swayed back and forth like seven different times waiting for the yeah. pitch, right? Tell us about that. Yeah, I'm right there squatting and I'm, I'm looking up at it because he's doing, because when, he, when he'd take his bat back, his head would go back. <laughs> You know, we've been hearing about the Astros stealing signs. Willie was trying to figure out what my sign was going to be. And he had the first base coach, a guy named Peanuts Lowry, that if Peanuts could pick up or see my signs or pick up a spitcher sign and he gave it to Willie, Willie bought him a new suit <laughs> if he ever called him home run. So Willie go up there and he's up here going like this. He goes about seven times and finally steps out of the box. He's, you're going to call a sign or what? I said, yeah, as soon as you quit trying to peek back here and get my sign, oh, man, you got me. You got me. And, you know, our relationship was born. And when he was given the Rawlings Gold Glove Award for his lifetime achievement, mm -hmm. he said, can I get Johnny to present it? Wow. He brought everything to baseball. And, you know, had he stayed in New York, he'd have been the greatest idol that we would ever, ever have. Babe, Mickey, Joe, no, Willie was the man. Well, you know, as we fast forward to today, baseball players, all athletes today, it seems like they are playing less and making more, right? And I go back as a, I'm sorry to say this, as a longtime Baltimore Oriole baseball fan, go back uh, to, I'm oh, so man. sorry, my sin, and Cal Ripken, 2,632 games in a row for the Baltimore Orioles, breaking, as you know, Lou Gehrig's record. Those were the days, as you say often, Johnny, you sign a contract and then you say to yourself, let's play ball. And you get on that field and you give it your all. How have things changed as you've seen this over the years and especially up to now with athletes who are playing the game today versus back when? Well, I made 2.2 in my entire career. So they make that in a, some of them almost in just a week, but it's two weeks as a rule. And in 1968, I didn't make the starting lineup. Don Pavletich had a great spring. So he caught the first four games and then pulled the hamstring. So I caught 154 out of 158. At shortstop, I could have played 7,000 games. I caught 52 days in a row without a day off. But with the new technology and the fact that we've got new trainers and we've got the fitness guys who come in and train all these muscles. And back in our day, Adam, it was hard to pull fat. Right. You just never had a fat muscle right. pull. I mean, our body fat was 14 or 15. Or 13 would be miraculous. And these guys are four and five and whatever. And now, a lot of times, the trainer has the first say. I mean, even to the manager and to the general manager saying he's he shouldn't throw more than 60 pitches. We see them disabled. We see them doing an oblique. You ever pulled an oblique? I have a tough time spelling oblique, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, you got agents. When they first started the big contracts, and it started with Kid Game Young up in Boston. The arbitrator gave him $3 million a year. He had won 10 games in the last three years. So somebody went in, his agent told him how he should be deserving if he'd have pitched every game. Well, you didn't. But there were arbitrators that would put him in. So once you gave him $3 million, then all of a sudden the stars got to be 14 or $15 million, And then they started opening it up to free agency. And, you know, Hicks gave uh, Rodriguez a $252 million contract. Unheard of. But I went in, you know, I, I made 11,000 my first year. I was in, rookie of the year, made 20. I was MVP, made 40. I was MVP again, I made 80. It goes without saying that, that those days are past. And now you're seeing clubs that are now worth three or four billion dollars. Exactly. And they sell them two billion, one billion, three billion. And you have to remember that there were, there were Fortune 500 guys that started buying these teams. Nobody had ever heard of them. Right. You had Jerry Jones. Who is Jerry Jones? He buys the Cowboys. Got his own radio show. He's got his own TV show. The governor's coming in. The president's throwing out the first pitch. It's a pretty good ego thing that goes along with it. So who's the benefit? All the baseball players. There's only 700 baseball players in the world that are in the major leagues. So we're kind of specialists. Well, you just convinced me that the 2.1 million that you made were all very hard-earned dollars versus today. <laughs> so let's talk about the changes. You referenced it a little bit, the new pitch clock the bigger bases, the rules on pickoffs, which you allege is a conspiracy against catchers, right? <laughs> I think the fans like the fact, Johnny, that the games are shorter. I think that's been a been a real advance. Definitely. What do you think of these these rules? And and is it indeed the catchers on the diamond who are taking the brunt of it? The clock is perfect. I mean, it's wonderful. I think that came maybe from the tennis days when you had only so long to serve instead of walking around back there and doing all that. 
and they figured it out. The bases, uh, you know, it's four inches difference. It's eight inches on a bag, a bag that's four inches closer and four inches away. And you got a runner that's uh, going to second within 3.1 seconds it takes him to steal a base. So the pitcher has to release it in about one, four, five. And they got, they got the stopwatch. They know exactly how long it takes him to release the ball. Mm -hmm. Now the catcher has to throw it 127 feet, three inches, put it six inches above the bag, and that's easy to do. Yeah. I don't mind it. We have a kid named Dela Cruz that's already stolen over 60 bases. Right. When I played, you know, here's Lou Brock, 118. Lou Brock. And, and, you know, Ricky Henderson stealing 600 bases. Right. But there was the speed. We had teams that were built around that. That I do like. I don't like the man on second. And they, I think baseball will look at that again and change it to some degree, you know, and, it, and it's, first of all, the pitchers are the one complaining because they're coming into relief. They're starting the 10th inning. The guy's on second. The guy's here's already your, halfway around. Yeah. <laughs> here's your hell on your hat. You know, you, see, you look at the guy and he's four and eight. Well, he came into the ninth inning and they scored a run. So there's a lot of good changes. Right. And, you know, the athletes, they are so phenomenal. There's some greatness to it. It's still the greatest game on earth. Going back, Johnny, to the Big Red Machine and the names. I mean, I looked it up again just to remind myself of how amazing that ball club was. You know, Joe Morgan, Concepcion, Griffey, Perez. These are legendary names, right? Who were you closest to among those players on that team and why? Well, Tony was the guy that was basically the glue for all of us. I mean, whether it was 0 for 4, 4 for 4. He never let up on you. He'd start digging at you, doing stuff, starting stuff. Hey, you know what Joe, Johnny said about you? He'd say it to Joe or Pete. And what do you, and I didn't say anything. What do you, but we, we lived that. But I go everywhere in the country. People come up to me and says, well, I was a Cub fan. I was a Dodger fan. I was this fan. But boy, we really respected you guys. Then they start naming the lineup. I mean, you think about the big fours, Pete, Joe, Tony, and myself, we call it. But the great eight, here you mentioned David. And he should be mentioned. But then we had Foster. We had 52 home runs. Yeah. We had Geronimo who won gold gloves. We had Ken Griffey in right field. I mean, we played the game the way everybody wanted us to play, the way we thought it was supposed to be played. But people really respected the fact that they came out to watch us. And that's why we were such a big draw. First of all, we had the names. And mm -hmm. we had the talent. And it'd be very difficult to pay the kind of money that we'd have to be paid to get all of those guys as a nucleus. It would make the Yankees payroll look cheap, right? To have to yeah. pay that kind of talent. Yeah. I mean, I say there is no I in team, but it's all lies. You better have the best individuals at each position. So you're, you're a success because Fabian's over there pushing the buttons. So, but if you don't have Fabian, if you have somebody that doesn't fill the bill, you don't even make the air. Well, the same thing happens in every business. Cause I wrote a book called catch every ball how to handle life's pitches. If you're going to make a team, you don't say, I'm going to take that table over there. We'll just make them our all star team. All star teams are made up by the best players. Companies are made up by the best players. So when I started writing the book, I started talking about business mm. and how you have to catch everything. If I need an insurance guy, if I need a banker, if I need an accountant, I'm going out and find the best person that can fill all those needs and do it. Sure. And so you always gravitate to the person who can catch every ball. And so that's when I started writing the book and talking about it. When I do my motivational speeches, I talk about the AEIOUs of life. I had different people write down their vows, different celebrities, different players. A is for me is an attitude. And you, you, you try it. Have your, have your listeners try it. How are you doing today? I'm awesome. I'm fantastic. And it changes your whole persona. It changes you to the point that you feel good about what you are. E is an effort for excellence. Why shouldn't you try to be the best? Why shouldn't you put it out there? I, the individual, always an opportunity we're all given. We don't have to compete against everybody. You is using people. I use them every day. I sit there with my friends at the breakfast bunch, and they're all successful. But I will use their knowledge. I learn new things every day. And I will quiz you on how to, you've been 40 years of doing this. So people are asking you, what do I have to do? Adam? Use their ability, use their knowledge, use their work, and then use your employees. Sparky used to come up to us, come up to me and say, my first day of spring training when he was mad, what do you think we took? Infield over there, pitching practice over there. That's I said. And I thought, God, he thinks I have a brain. <laughs> he thinks I actually know. And I'm like, right. and sometimes it's why you are important. 
You don't hold your happiness in the hands of others. Yeah. You can't wait for them to applaud. You go out, you do something, you set a goal, and then when you achieve it, then you wind up doing something for yourself. I don't care if it's going to golf balls, go fishing, lay in a hammock, sit in a bubble bath, something that tells you that you are good. Well, I tell you, Johnny, I'm already working on my AEIOU. I'll send this to you after the show. See how I did. One of those things, though, was Bobby Knight. Bobby Knight. And I asked him for his vows. And his first one was what? A, keep the assholes away from you. <laughs> and I said, isn't that the truth? We don't want our kids hanging around right. bad people. Right. Why are we hanging around bad people? And so, and Gary McCord had an O. But his O was his circle of friends. It yeah. was almost the same thing Interesting. of being able to surround yourself with the yeah. best people, quality people that had the same ideas, the same view, values as you do. And then you don't wind up being swayed away from things. Johnny, you know, a lot of people who have success early in life somewhat rest on their laurels. And that's kind of the high point and everything else seems to be kind of downhill from there. You didn't play it that way. And you, and you started not playing that way when you were 22 years old. When you joined Bob Hope on that USO tour in Ubon, Thailand, before the troops, and did a very fun number with Bob Hope, did you have any kind of nervousness about being on stage? I guess I should have been, but he made it so comfortable. He was just such a special guy, and Bob and I talked every week almost until he passed. Mm -hmm. And he'd have a new story, or he'd have things, just wanted to find out how I was, but I uh, was asked to go, and I asked my mom and dad, I'm, they want me to go on his Christmas. Dude. What would you think? Yeah. you got to go. So I go to Burbank. I'm met by Bob. And from the very beginning, Bob was all about you looking good, hmm. giving you a new line. Hmm. you got to think about the game, the game, the game. you got to think about the game. Booze and broads may be great, but for now they'll have to wait while we think about the game. And so... We were on stage. We would we rode together in all these planes. We know the 141s, I think it was, that we flew. Yeah. And we went to West Point. We went to England. We went to Germany. We went down to Greece. We were on the John F. Kennedy. We flew into mm -hmm. Bangkok. We flew into Long Bend, Da Nang, and uh, Camp Eagle up near Way. And I still get, you know, cards, letters, and thank yous from those guys that were over in Vietnam. Because here I was. I'm 22 years old. I'm healthy. I'm done playing baseball. And they're over there fighting for us. That was the most nervous I got was how would I be received? Would they be upset that I'm not fighting the war as well with them right. side by side? Right. But they made me feel at home, made me feel comfortable. And I'm, to this day, I still try to stay involved with the military. Well, you do because you've done so much work for Hope for the Warriors and others. You just came out of, I think, another celebrity golf tournament earlier this month in North Carolina. Why is it that you have such a passion for supporting, and it's not just the people that have served, it's also their families, long after they come back from the battlefield. In so many ways, I want all the organizations to blend together and, and unite. And when I was playing in Camp Lejeune, we had a thing called the Celebrity Golf Association. And I was playing, I was on the first tee. Mm -hmm. I'm playing with General Bob Dickerson, who was the commanding general for Camp Lejeune. He calls it Lejeune, so I, I do now too. <laughs> but we're standing on the first tee, and I'm in the backswing, and the phone rings. I said, who are you talking to? She said, well, I'm talking to my son in Afghanistan. Wow. And I walked her, give me that phone. I talked to him for about 10 minutes. <laughs> we didn't care if we held up the course. And then we started, you know, uh, with Robin Kelleher and her group, Hope for the Warriors. I see the commitment they have. And then Doug said, why don't we co-host this? I said, be happy to. So we go up there and we started visiting our warriors on, on the base. We started you know, we do the simulators, we would do the, the weapons, we would do the things. And, and but I started playing golf with these warriors that were blown up. That's what they call it. They call it, I'm, I was blown up. Well, they'd have two or three different artificial limbs. You know what they wanted to do? They wanted to go back. They wanted to go back to serve they again. To go back. Yeah. yeah. So at those days, 70 and 80 percent of the of what we did and what most organizations do is that we, we treated them. We gave them limbs. We gave them facilities where they could work out. Mm -hmm. Today, it's about 70, 80% for the psych side of it. You know, we know they have PTSD. We know that 22 servicemen commit suicide almost every day because they can't deal with it. We were in Daytona, and there was a one of those Navy SEALs with us, and he couldn't come out. He couldn't come out of his room. I mean, he's 6'4", 
260, built like everything, and but he couldn't come out. Yeah. And so those are the people that we want to get to and treat, especially for the families. I mean, the mental and the financial anguish that they have to deal with. There's a group called USA Cares that I've been a part of a little bit. Doug still is totally involved with them. You know, you can't pay your mortgage. Right. You can't buy groceries. Right. And so they give them cards and debit cards and, and gift cards and stuff that they can support themselves. I just hope we can reach out. I hope the government can extend more and more to these people who have, you know, are warriors. Johnny, you've lived a very blessed life and you had an experience. And I wanted to see if you still kind of relive that experience a little bit where you were on that bus with your fellow baseball players and Binger. I'm not sure if you were going to or from a game. There was an accident. You went down a 50 foot ravine. Two of your friends lost their lives. You were, I think, unconscious for a while. Do you think back about that as kind of one of those moments of divine intervention in a way that gave you even more impetus and more motivation to do what you set out to do and have done in your life? We were actually coming back from the game and as fate would have it, at the top of the hill, it used to be a Y, then they made a T intersection with a new road. And at the top of the hill, we had a player named Houston Dumbo. We called him Spud, mm -hmm. Indian boy, about five foot eight, could run like the wind, do all this stuff. And we would stop at the top of the hill and let him off because that's where he lived. Well, he didn't come to the game that day. So we we'd go down the hill and it was April 1st because Lloyd Dency, our driver, the, who was coach, was driving the bus mm -hmm. and said, we don't have any brakes and we're going down the incline. Wow. And I've been driving trucks with my dad. I was 15 years old delivering propane. And so he said, if you're ever in an accident, get in the floor. And I'm telling gear it down, gear it down. Well, he couldn't get it geared down. And the person pulled the emergency brake, we're doing it. And so I jumped across the, ro the row and grabbed David Gutter and pulled him down on the floor and jumped on top of him. And we couldn't make the curve, hit the rail, flipped over three times down the embankment. And uh, Billy Wiley and Harold Sims lost their lives. And I was hanging, the door was open, my feet were hanging out the back door. Mm -hmm. At the funeral we had for the boys, I couldn't go up. And, and, I, and I realized, I guess I was a fatalist at that time, that fate stepped in. Now I go two years, three years later, I broke my thumb in Buffalo. I go back to Oklahoma City to see the family. We had played American Legion at Anadarko, and I went up to see one of the players I played with in Wichita, and I drove back. And it's a four lane highway. I pulled out to pass the bus. Here's the drunk, drunk driver on the wrong side of the highway. Wow. Hit my brakes, he hit me right in the door. Only thing I remember was getting in the ambulance the first time I regained consciousness. I was, don't, I, don't let me die because mom and dad will be so sad. <laughs> <laughs> and so I get to the hospital and the doctor said, son, you're the, you got the biggest bones I've ever seen in my life. He said, not a, one other person would ever walk out of this, but you. Wow. And I played baseball three weeks later in the instructional league down in Clearwater, Florida. And so I've, I've faced all of this, I guess, in so many ways. I see death around me. Uh, one of the most meaningful things, and I will say this because I think it's important for all your listeners and everything else. Billy Werber was, his wife had just passed away and I was at an event. And Billy, I'm so sorry. He said, don't be. He said, you realize how lucky I was to have that person in my life for 50 years. Some people are never that fortunate. And I have told everybody, and I, and I try to pass it on, that we ought to be happy with having people in our lives that are meaningful to us for whatever period they're there. But we can grieve and we can do it, but we must still move on. And I guess that's what I, that bus was. I had to move on and to be able to accomplish, you know, from that car wreck. And then five days after I turned 25, I had part of my lung taken out because I had a, a spot on the lung. So, you know, I've sort of lived through everything. You know, you go back to Binger and Sharon is the, my, she was the vice president of the class. <laughs> If I got time, I will tell Sharon called me and said, you know, it's our five year class reunion and it's up to you as president of the class to put it together. And I said, well, as class president, I hear about it, want you and Sue to run this. <laughs> you got to delegate authority. So she called three That's days smart. later and said, I'd like to, we'd like to have everybody put in three dollars and bring a covered dish. I said, boy, are we going to have some fun <laughs> and we're going to have a parade for you because you're player of the year. Yeah. And we've got Doc Pfeiffer's convertible that you can sit in. And we invited dignitaries from Oklahoma City and from, from the Reds. So we gathered down at the Cotton Gym, and we all lined up, and we take off uptown. Nobody's there. No Everybody's there. in the parade. <laughs> Everybody's in the parade. Everybody was there. And we made a U-turn at the police station, and we waved at each other as we went back by. 
Well, Johnny, I know that the people of Binger are very proud of you. I mean, you put a sign leaning into town, welcoming their hometown hero to all that come into Binger, Oklahoma. But what you've done beyond that, beyond the town of Binger, beyond the national pastime of baseball, what you've done for men and women in uniform and others and giving them hope and motivation and a reminder of what it takes to really be successful in life. And I think the bottom line on, on being successful is being true to yourself and being good with and around others. And I think you lived your life that way. You're a role model for having done it that way. And I think you're just as important and just as vital to everything that's going on today as you were as a part of the big red machine back in the glorious days. Thank you for being a part of this uh, show. We are honored. I'm proud to be with you. I'm, I'm, I really am. And it's nice that, you know, we can share this time together and I'll just keep on truck on, keep on, keep on. You know, we, uh, it's part of our DNA now at this point to help others and to be supportive of others and hopefully guide them in the right direction. I, my son started college and we gave him a little cake and going and said, believe and achieve. And that's all we hopefully can do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnny. You take care of yourself. 